you know, that, that made all that stuff work. Uh, so it was a first time through, but it got the attention of the FERC, okay, and others, and that's where this notion that we have to, we have to increase our altitude in transmission planning because we can spend the $80 billion and it's economic. If you took that same $80 billion and divided it up amongst all those groups and let them do something, you would end up with close to what you would get in the coordinating plan. You know, in terms of being able to transfer energy uh, around the eastern interconnection footprint and to fix the issues that we're dealing with today. Other comments or questions? Yep. Could you describe the Texas event you talked about? I'm not from <clears throat> yeah, in Texas it was February, and uh, basically they had a, a significant amount of wind. Maybe it was uh, 1,800 megawatts or something like that overnight and uh, into the early morning. And then when the loads started to rise, the wind went down precipitously, down to about 300 megawatts over three hours. Okay, so now with the load rising, wind falling off, they had to scramble. Okay, to get resources online to meet that load. It actually invoked a demand response, you know, where they shed some load, but that was one of the resources that they had, right. you know, to, to do that. And I think that sent the wrong, the wrong signal because, oh, <coughs> right, they, they lost load. It was a blackout. No, it was a program that they had, and those folks were compensated for responding that way. Uh, they would have done a better job with the forecasting in place because they'd have seen it. Uh, a little bit ahead of time, and they probably wouldn't have had to use the demand response tool. Okay, um, they would have probably got some units spinning and, and, and hot and, and loaded them up. I've heard that, that some of these wind turbines, the, the equipment comes from other countries. Are those being made anywhere in the United States such that there's an impetus for the stimulus package to be used? Yeah, well. Um, Let's see, uh, Vestas is a, a Danish wind turbine manufacturer and they have manufacturing facilities in the U.S. GE has manufacturing facilities in the U.S., but they also have some in Europe. Uh, Gamesa, Spanish wind turbine manufacturer, facilities in the U.S. So Siemens, Siemens uh, same thing. So it's, it's like automobiles. It's kind of hard to trace, you know, where this, where this all goes around. One of the, I think it's partly because of the, industry, the wind industry wanting to make sure that the economic development benefits are seen by folks. Mm. And part of it is just logistics, you know, building stuff closer to where it's going to be used. Because if you're talking about these big pieces and parts like planes, for example, uh, you, you substantially increase the logistics problem if you're building them in Europe. And you got to somehow get them to port in Europe and land them in the U.S. and then... All the energy. You know, bring that, yeah. So, um, but I, I do think it's kind of like automobiles because it's hard to, you know, is a Toyota made in Georgetown, Kentucky, is that an American car or not? Probably have time for two more questions. Yeah. Uh, is, is, does anyone talk about a possible danger to small private aircraft through the towers uh, that it require lighting? The, the towers require lighting. Um, the, uh, on the blades? Or? Not on the blades, on the uh, on the on the nacelle. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I know that you know when we got to the one megawatt scale, that the turbines got big enough that the FAA required no. the lighting. But I'm not sure about all the rules. Two hundred feet and higher. Two hundred feet and higher. Okay. So you know, uh, uh, right now we're talking blades that are 120 feet long. So that means that the nacelle is 240 feet, and when the blade is sticking straight up, it's 360 feet. Long. Minimum legal altitude for private airplanes usually 800 to 1,000 feet. 800, and then those areas are, map, are marked on the aviation maps. I mean, the fact that there's turbines there. Well, only if they're above a certain height. Oh, okay. But yes, tall towers are marked. Okay, but if we were... Okay. By the ultra lights and uh, lighters, etc. Yeah. One more. One more comment or question. We'll wrap up this. I want to one. Is there something, is, is, is the wind predictable? I mean, wind's usually blowing at 2 o'clock here and usually at 7 o'clock here. Yeah. You know, is there some sense of where the wind blows or is it all really so erratic that you could hardly account for No, there's, there's some pretty good sense that, you know, the, if we think, we're getting a lot of energy, okay, out of this moving airstream, right? It has inertia. 
okay? And, and you know, we know where it is sometimes because the, the Weather Service does this for our protection. You know, there's fronts coming through and stuff, and, and they know where those fronts are situated, you know, at any given hour kind of thing. So it is predictable. You can also predict pretty well over the course of the year how many megawatt hours a plant's going to generate. But if it comes down to hour by hour tomorrow and for the next three days, that's where it gets difficult. But that's also part of the industry practice, the, the power industry practice. And then we did that exercise. I'm going to forecast my load tomorrow, the next day, and the next day, and then I'm going to determine what units need to run and all that. So, you know, wind is kind of colliding with that because that's a, that's a difficult one. Also, uh, just also, two hours from now, you know, I'm going to see this, this big sudden increase in wind. The Pacific Northwest, uh, <coughs> BPA for example, there's a lot of turbines on the Columbia Gorge. Okay, so now you have this sort of amplifying geographic feature that tends to exacerbate these ramps and stuff. You won't see that as much in the Midwest where things are spread out more. But you can have situations where uh, that predictability is difficult and it's also important from an operational sense. Thanks. Okay. We're starting to lose people, so I, what I'd like to do is take a moment to have one more comment because there's a fellow sitting in who has waited so patiently, probably as long as I've ever seen him wait patiently for his last comment. So we're going to take one more, okay. make a few comments, and then I would you be available to continue the discussion yeah. for a little bit? Yeah. John? Oh, thank you. The, the, the comment about the, the manufacturing base and as you think about wind and wind energy development and the stimulus package and all those things, the primary economic benefit from a jobs standpoint is where you manufacture the components. And so Nebraska Public Power District gets a gold star for their efforts to recruit manufacturing to Nebraska. Uh, they have done an excellent job. Uh, the State Department of Economic Development, not so much. And so they're just getting on board. But So we're losing out plants. So we lost a blade plant to South Dakota, uh, Knight Carver. We lost another blade plant to Iowa. We lost uh, the latest Siemens plant was between Sioux City and, and Hutchinson, Kansas. We just went to Hutchinson. I talked to Siemens uh, a couple weeks ago. Nebraska was not in the hunt. Uh, and yet, yeah, if you, you look at our state st strategically, we are in the middle of the most wind you can have with the best infrastructure, the best north, south, east, west roads, railroad, all of those kinds of things, and uh, very cost effective and affordable electricity. And so, as you think about all the things you could do to maximize the benefits of wind in Nebraska, recruiting, more aggressively recruiting, manufacturing, would be a huge benefit to our state. Thanks, John. I am going to take control back just for a couple of minutes and then we can continue. But would you first help me thank Bob for one <laughs>